mock him. We'll come back on that. So in Genesis 21 verse 10, when she saw that, it says, Wherefore, Sarah said unto the husband Abraham, she said, cast out this bond woman and her son. For the son of this bond woman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. When the woman saw that which Ishmael did, she went to the husband and told Abraham, cast out this Hagar out of this house with her child. Because this son is not going to inherit or share the inheritance with my son Isaac. That is what came out of Sarah's mouth after she saw Ishmael mocking at the feast. So now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about it. Because you have to remember the platform of this feast. It was Sarah that gave Hagar as wife to her husband Abraham when Sarah couldn't conceive and Ishmael was born now the Lord visited Sarah as we saw last week Sarah now has a child Isaac and the father or the husband Abraham decided to throw a party and during this party Sarah noticed Ishmael's attitude toward his son Isaac and did not go to the the mother Hagar but went straight to the husband and said I need you to send away Hagar with Ishmael out of this place because I don't want to see Ishmael dividing uh, inheritance that you will leave for my son Isaac. Everybody is quiet and the reason why we are quiet is because we wonder why Sarah will make such a statement. Because Ishmael is also Abraham's son. So if you don't want to see Hagar uh, to have anything of your husband, I understand. But what about the child? And her statement is very straightforward. He said, I don't have any problem with the bond woman. I have a problem with Ishmael, your son. I need you to send that son away with the mother. This is what Sarah said to the husband. You know, I'm quiet because it is very disturbing. Most of marriages, inheritance is a big deal, even though it's not openly said when one is alive. But it is a big deal. And especially when there is more than one woman in the marriage, everybody is fighting for his own or for her own. That is a fact. I said his own because it doesn't work in one direction. Today, the way that life is going, 
Uh, men are also looking for inheritance from women. You, you guys are laughing, but it is the truth. Some will go to the extent whereby when they even offer to buy life insurance for the wife, the wife will say no. Because I know where you might be going. It will not be straightforward. But the fact is that because of inheritance, one cannot be truthful to the other and everybody is playing games. So when Sarah made such a statement, we wonder, this is the Bible and this is Abraham. The covenant that God made that you know, stays forever is this covenant with Abraham, Abrahamic covenant. We are Jesus Christ came also under that covenant. This is to tell you how important it is. But it is also to tell you that the reason why I'm dwelling on this whole Abraham stuff, don't get bored with it because we are not done. It is because such a great man of God that God himself said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God to identify himself with a man, it means that there have been something or there is something right with this man. But now, from the very beginning that God called Abraham, all of us, we have seen in details, you know, the life of Abraham from different angles. And this one here is also mentioned in the Bible. So it is to tell you that God cares about every single thing that we are living in our homes. Our God is not a God that is far. Our God is a family man. Our God, he cares about mothers, he cares about fathers, he cares about children, and he cares also about inheritances. And it is very good because if your wife one day will come to you and start talking to you about inheritance, probably that day you are not going to be happy because you will tell that woman, are you seeking for me to die? Why am I alive when you are talking to me about my inheritance? Especially when it comes to African men. May the Lord help us. Because first of all, we don't always have the mind to leave something behind. We just want to enjoy life and then just go. We will see all this stuff because if God is talking about inheritance, it means that it is something that is important in the sight of God. The way that the platform is set by Sarah coming to the husband and talking to the husband, send this woman with the child away because I don't want this child to come and share inheritance with my son, Isaac. What, on what base or on what basis is she standing on to say, such a thing when both children are the children of the husband you sarah you are the one that brought hagar to your husband and you didn't say that have just have a child you said that take her as your wife so now why is it that you want your husband to send her away how is god going to deal with such a situation abraham didn't divorce hagar hey it is sarah that is making such a statement. Abraham never said that now that my, my wife Sarah, my covenant wife Sarah has a child, Hagar, you, you know, you can go or leave me with, the, with, 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 with my son and you are here as a slave. I'm giving you your freedom. Now you can leave and just go. He never came up with such a thing. But the woman, Sarah, Sarah, that quiet woman who will be in that tent, she is the one that is making such a statement. And she went straight. Sarah, Sarah is a very powerful woman. Sarah is not somebody who will talk behind, behind you. Sarah is always confronting the husband and talking straight to the husband. Went and told the husband, send the woman away. The last time that she showed up as well, she said that I have a woman here for you. Marry her. That is Sarah. Okay, since God is talking about inheritance, 
You know, in Genesis 15, verse 7 and 8, that we have visited before, it says this. God came to Abraham one day and told Abraham, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Did you hear that? That is inheritance. The first time that God visited Abraham, when Abraham was already on the land, the Lord came to Abraham and said that I am the one that brought you here. This land that you are standing on, I have brought you here to inherit that land. God cares about inheritance. Amen. And he said, Abraham said to God, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? So you can tell that it is not only in, in Sarah's mind that in, in inheritance is important. As much as inheritance is important in God's mind, inheritance is also important in the mind of Abraham as well. Because Abraham asked God right away, God, how can I be sure of what you just said, that you will give me this land to inherit it? God said, you want to know? Are you doubting that which I am saying? Don't worry. Look, look at this. In Genesis 15 verse 8, it says that the very day that Abraham made that statement of question, how shall I know? Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit the land? In the same day, Genesis 15, 18, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Ephrates. Amen and amen. God who cannot swear to anything else because there is nothing greater than himself. That day, the Lord said, I am entering into a covenant with you. That is my word to you. And that day, you remember everything we talk about when the Lord asked Abraham, bring the pigeon, bring the lamb, bring, you know, cut everything into two. And the Lord put Abraham into sleep. That was the very moment that God started telling Abraham, that which is yet to come. Your descendants, they are going to be in slavery. And the land where they will be in slavery, I am also going to judge them. That same day that the Lord made the statement and the covenant with Abraham, simply because Abraham wanted to make sure of his inheritance. You are talking to me about inheritance. God, how shall I know? The Lord said, here is my covenant to you. Sarah seeing Ishmael mocking at the feast. This feast is the outdooring for Sarah and Isaac. And the concubine that's right there with the, 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 the son, Ishmael mocking at the feast. Sarah said, you, have, you are going. I'm not coming to you. I'm not fighting you, Hagar. I want to show you that I am the master. You remember the last time that Sarah dealt straight with Hagar? She sent her away from that house. And in the wilderness over there, the angel of the Lord went back to the wilderness and fetched Hagar to come back to that house. That is Sarah. That is Sarah. So, we have already proven that everybody, all the personalities in this situation, they are all interested in inheritance. And everyone and each one of us sitting down here, even though we might not have anything, but we are still interested in inheritance. Amen and amen. Okay, so now let's come back. To our scriptures what is it that abraham is going to say when sarah came to him and told him to send his own son and the wife away so in genesis 21 
verse 11, it says, And the thing that Sarah said to Abraham was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. It was very grievous to him because of his son, Ishmael. It hurt him. He didn't take it lightly. He saw the seriousness about the whole situation. As a man, and knowing and considering Ishmael as his son as well. You are my covenant wife, but this is what you are coming to tell me. He grieved him. Very, very sad. So now, <laughs> we thank God. Let's see what will happen. Uh, why wouldn't he be grieved? And we thank God that it is happening that way because everyone and each one of us as fathers, you will have the same attitude. And this one here, right, you have to connect. If you are lucky, you have had your, your, your very first husband up to this point. You didn't come as a second wife. But if you have come as a second wife, or a second husband, most likely, you might have somebody in the house that is probably not of your blood, but is of the blood of your wife, or of the blood of your husband. So everyone and each one of us, when it comes to this inheritance situation, uh, we connect very well. Everybody. If you say you don't have a child, let me tell you, you yourself, it's a somebody's child, which means that you have a father and you are probably looking for inheritance from your father as well. Listen to what the word of God says about man's responsibility and why Abraham was touched by what Sarah said. In Proverbs 13 and the verses 22, the word of God says a good man Leave it an inheritance to his children's children. This is the word of God. A good man leave it inheritance for his children's children. You are not look, look, you know, living inheritance. Uh, so, in other words, any man that will not leave inheritance behind is a, an evil man. I didn't say it. Bible said it. If you are living your life and you are living just for yourself, that you will not be thinking about the future of your children. You know, some are so hard to even think of the future of their own children. How much more their children's children. That is how wicked you are. You have to pray to God to bless you. If you don't have, you can't leave anything behind. Some all that they are living is problems. And nobody wants to inherit you anyway because they know that that which you have is already problems and god calls you an evil man don't leave problems behind you say good man leave it inheritance to his children's children since god didn't precise what type of inheritance the lord is not talking about death god is talking about inheritance something that is going to be beneficial for your children's children the future generations it's our responsibility to pray to god to bless us most of the time when we pray, we ask God to bless us for that which we will be eating and uh, clothing and uh, dwelling, the house and everything else, but we are not necessary. Taking our prayers to the next level. Father, my seed, my generations to come. Bless me so that I shall be a blessing to generations. It is something that a child of God must be sensitive to. So if you are living here in America and all that you care for, is your well-being and uh and that would be it god calls you an evil man an evil woman as well a good man liveth inheritance for his children's children so now abraham is grieved that abraham will be grieved because abraham is uh, a man of god he knows God's position about 
inheritances because he himself had already asked God that, that question. So why would you send Ishmael away? Why do you want me to send Ishmael away? I should also leave inheritance for my son Ishmael as I'm going to leave something for Isaac. So Sarah, what, where is this coming from? Why would you take such a position? What do you want to put me in? Now, Abraham is now in this situation. And in Genesis 21 verse 12, listen to this. To our surprise, God came into the situation. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy born woman. In all that Sarah had said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Hallelujah. Let me explain the scripture here. Abraham is grieved. Sarah had already made her point and waiting to see what Abraham will come up with. Abraham also knows about this whole inheritance stuff. Abraham was very sure that God's position was his position. Why would I leave uh, Ishmael aside when it comes to my inheritance? By the way, this is also telling you that it's not a taboo to talk about inheritance when you are alive with your wife and with your husband because everything is happening just right there. Don't wait until one dies and be looking for the will. Don't. And all the craftiness that we play among ourselves, it has to stop as a child of God. And this is the position that a child of God must have. You will know my view in details as we keep progressing. But at the end of the day, the woman that you know that you're going to spend the rest of your life with, the problem is that most of the time we don't know. Because every time that there is a problem in the marriage, the whole marriage is in question. The man wants to see the woman living. The woman also wants to see, you know, after so many years of marriage, situation comes. And the woman said, I'm living. So the doubt is always just right there. And we are not certain about inheritances. The man is not even thinking of leaving something behind because this unstable woman, the hatred toward your wife most of the time is also, you know, related or pushed on the children. You are an evil man and you are an evil woman as well. You must take God's point of view and do the right thing if your wife for one reason or another along the line had changed and had become evil and wants to divorce you or even had already divorced you and you are telling the children okay go with your wicked mother i don't want to see any of you god calls you a wicked man as well so everybody have to have a clear understanding on this Coming to the normal position is that we are called to be husband and wife. We are set to live our lives for the rest of our earthly days here as God had programmed. And the Lord said it, a good man. A good man does not mean I believe. We said it. That is not something that should come from the man alone. God never said that me as a woman I should leave inheritance for my children. Who told you? This is a kingdom principle. A good man liveth inheritance for his children's children. It is simply meaning that if you are set to live on this earth here, your responsibility, if you have children, think of living something before you go. It has nothing to do with, with you being female or male. Absolutely not. This is not a responsibility of a man alone. This is kingdom principle. That a child of God must understand and live your life that way. So if you are in the marriage and thinking that, oh, you are looking for everything to come from the husband. 
and telling your children that you look at your wicked uh, father who had died never leave you anything what about you what did you work for everybody has to be sensitive about the approach of the word of the living god so that we'll be doing the right thing but the question here is that you are into this marriage for that which you seek for yourself only or your mind is right that indeed as much as you woman as a man you said you love your children so much but then come to the, the, the requirement of God's principle do the right thing don't be selfish in both cases male as female, female husband as wife but most of the time the culture that we come from we are always looking for the man the father to bring forth the inheritance that is why when they get to you know countries like america where they can put insurance on you they said okay if you die first at least i will also have something but you see that is not you know when you come to talk about life insurance like that right it looks like something that is evil it's not evil everybody will die everyone will die but our mindset is that if i go for life insurance the fact that you you have a life insurance doesn't mean that you are going to die or it, 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 is it because every month that you receive the payment for the life insurance it reminds you of your death or of your future death we are not always prompt to you know to go on that direction because of the fear of death but as children of God, it is very true. If we position ourselves right and do that which God is asking us to do, we will not have issues with life insurance. When you die, if you didn't leave anything for the children, at least that what you have paid for, let it be money released unto the children. I am not here to promote any insurance, uh, life insurance company or anything like that. I'm just telling you that which is right. You know why? It's because we have seen situations people die and we have to run around to be looking for money to even bury. The woman is left with the children and nothing to even bury. If you live a life and at your death your burial is a problem then you are truly a problem if you live a life on this earth here and you die to the extent that even your burial is a problem because there is no money to bury you you are very useless it is very true you never care about the word of God, never care about the wife, never care about the children, never care about anything. You are just everything that came to your hand, you are just eating it. I am eating it when I die, I die and I go. What type of mentality is that? If we don't talk about these things, I mean these are stuff that nobody is talking about it. We don't talk about it because it's related to death. We don't talk about life insurance. We don't talk about husband and wife sitting down and getting things together because of the little, little problems that we have. Nobody is certain. Probably you are not certain in the marriage. You are not certain that you will keep your husband till the very end. And you are not certain that you will keep that same wife till the very end. What about the case that you have worked so much with one woman? Everything that you got was from with the sweat of that woman. The time comes, you sent that woman away. You go marry another one and you are not thinking about the children of that woman and the, that woman herself. The one who did not work is now the one that is coming to. And those children are not even yours anyway. So when it comes to inheritance, you can see that the branches to talk about are so much. So, so much. So the Lord is right. That is why I love this whole series of Abraham because we can identify we see abraham as god called him a man of me meaning that i am the god of abraham abraham went through the struggles that is current or every one of us are going through problems our daily problems and everything else this is it 
And that is how these things are going to be resolved as well with God. Amen and amen. The Lord came to Abraham. Let me come back to the scripture. In Genesis 21, 12, God said unto Abraham, Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bond woman. In all that Sarah had said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. God said, I agree with Sarah. Listen, God came to Abraham and told Abraham, Abraham, listen to what Sarah said. What type of God is that? God of justice, God of righteousness, God who does not despise, God who is not partial. And the God is coming to tell Abraham, Abraham, your wife Sarah said, send that born woman, that Egyptian woman, and the child that she got from your husband, Abraham, Ishmael, away. Listen to everything that Sarah said you should do and go ahead and do it. This is what God, God said. Amen and amen. The women are in power now. They said, you see, it is even said in the Bible that husband, listen to me. Okay, so let's get down to details. In Genesis 21, verse 12, the first part of it, God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy born woman. Listen, Abraham is a just man. Abraham had married Hagar, and Abraham considers Hagar as wife. You know why he grieved Abraham? The explanation is just right here. Because of the son, Ishmael, and the wife, Hagar. That is what the Bible says. So Abraham was not like, oh, I was grieved because that is my son. And I don't care about that woman. No, he cares. He cares for both of them. This is the fact. So, you know, it means that as much as you know that woman might not whatever problem that two of you will have as husband and wife and tomorrow something happens God is simply saying that this whole inheritance stuff one must approach it with a lot of delicacy a lot I am no more with that woman but you have a child with a woman. Now I had a child or children with the, the, my new wife that I love so much. Every time that that man remembers that old wife, all wickedness, only evil. Therefore, your will, the woman's name will never appear anywhere. How much more wicked mother, wicked children. And we are thinking in that direction. God came in. The God that you would turn to and said, God, please be the judge of this situation. If Hagar, when Hagar will hear such a statement, remember the same God that fetched Hagar out of that desert and brought her back. The Lord told Hagar, he said, don't worry. Because of Ishmael, you will be blessed. I will be with you as well. So if Hagar was to go to God and tell God, listen to what this woman, Sarah, you told me to come back and submit to her. I have done that. But look at what she's doing to me now. What is the answer that Hagar was to going to get from God? God would have told Hagar, Hagar, they said, go, go. I will be with you. When probably Hagar will, will not expect that answer from God. It is true because if it was the opposite, 
God would not have told Abraham, listen to that which Sarah said. America here, it is not open for to have two wives. But if for any reason you have more than one wife, one of you might not go to your husband and tell your husband that did you hear the message that Pastor Charles preached today? Send that woman away with her children. And you are thinking that God will back you up. Absolutely not. Or maybe yes. I don't know. Amen and amen. This is so interesting because when one is living in carnality, thinking that you are going to do or you are doing God's will, not knowing you are even working against God's will. If the Lord did not come to Abraham, there is no way that... If, you don't know. I was going to say that there is no way that Abraham would send Hagar away. There's no way. Because the last time, you remember when he, I, I mean Sarah went to Hagar and dealt with Hagar, the Bible says that Hagar flee. She said, I can't take this in this house. So she ran. It wasn't Abraham that said, with all these problems over here, please go your way. Abraham was touched because of the son and Hagar as well. So in Genesis 21 verse 12, the second part of it, when God came to him, the Lord said, In all that Sarah had said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. Everything that Sarah had told you, Abraham, hear and do exactly as your wife said. Women are fighting for inheritances. Children are also fighting for inheritances. Especially when they know that there is wealth and problems all over. And especially when they are not from the same mother. And sometimes when they are of the same mother and the same father, the problem is still the same. The children are still fighting. By the end of the day, you know, in Proverbs 19, verse 14, listen to the word of God. Proverbs 19, verse 14. It says, House and riches are the inheritance of fathers. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers. And a prudent wife is from the Lord. A prudent wife is from the Lord. Amen and amen. You know what is happening here? God is comparing houses and riches with a wife. The Lord is saying that between houses and riches and a prudent wife, you better choose a prudent wife. In other words, Sarah was a prudent wife. Sarah was a prudent wife. Therefore, everything that Sarah is talking about by sending Ishmael and Hagar away, go ahead and do it, Abraham. A prudent wife. Who is a prudent wife? Is it the wife that is seeking everything for herself so that when the husband is dead, she can go and marry another man? And nothing coming to the children. We have seen this is, these situations as well. But God said a good man liveth inheritance for his children's children. Are you fighting your husband because your husband did not leave the inheritance in your name. But left the inheritance in the children's name. And you are probably saying that if this, all this stuff belongs to the children... The children of today, tomorrow, they might not take care of me. And they are happening. These things are happening right here and right now. 
when the children, even that which the parents had worked for, when they are still in their old ages, their own money, for somebody to take good care of them in their old ages, they said, no, 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 the money is finishing. You will not have anything left. So you have to die early. Children's attitude as well. So with all these platforms that are set, man is balancing. May God help us. May the Lord help us. People are killing for inheritance. People are fighting for inheritances. Homes are broken for inheritances. And when it comes to God, for a woman that is, the woman will quote this scripture to you. Did you not read what God said to Abraham when Sarah went? Especially Christian woman. Take time, Christian woman. Amen. A prudent wife. Who is a prudent wife? Who is better than houses and riches? I believe that a wife that will lay with a husband onto the purpose of the living God. Understanding that both of you are called by God. That no matter what, the Lord will see both of you through. That is what I told my wife. I said, here, listen to me. Heaven, there is no marriage. Marriage is only here. Don't give me hard time in this place. Do not, let us not give ourselves a hard time. Let us live in harmony. Fulfilling the plan of God for our lives. Judgment is not couple. Judgment is individual. Everybody is going to stand before the Lord alone. I mean, if our minds are right, the woman who had been by your side all along, sweat fighting, tough times, good times, and everything else, why do you want to cheat or play games against each other? Inheritances, money, and I mean, you, you name it. At the end of the day, everything bundled to money. Stuck. But God said, house, this is property, properties, and riches. If you have a good wife, a prudent wife, it's better. If you are not lucky, that woman will take a few years and she will still kill you. Because every time she will put something small in your soup for you to drink. And it will take time for you to die. And the doctors will be like, this is natural death. Natural death. Human body is very complicated. When a woman wants to kill you, she will kill you. That is why you have to eat with your wife. Amen. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. When I said this, it looks like, uh, but it's both sides because men can also kill their wives anyway. So let's sit down, you know, <laughs> eat together. Family that eat together, they pray together. Family that pray together, they eat together. Uh, we don't die together, but we at least <laughs> eat together. Amen and amen. Inheritance. No dubious minds. In marriages, God is very clear. That which has been the downfall of so many. So many, their lives are messed up because of these little, little things in our homes. But God said, house and riches compared to a prudent woman, you better choose that prudent woman. Women right, praise the Lord. Oh, I thought you were going to say hallelujah. <laughs> amen and amen. Somebody was saying that, Pastor, you are always taking men's side. But today, God is taking women's side. Amen and amen. I don't take anybody's side. I take God's side. So now, in Proverbs 20, verse 21, it says, An inheritance, an inheritance may be gotten hastily, at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. I am quiet because I need you to meditate on this scripture. 
and inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. So you better watch what you are doing. When you are playing games so that you can have so much, when you are sending your wife away so you can keep the house or the houses and the riches, when you are killing your husband so that you can keep, keep the houses and the riches, God is also talking about you. The Lord said that whichever crafty way that you live your life to get that which you have, that is why I said that be careful not to be victim of inheritance issues because you can be but God is warning everybody that that which you didn't get by the righteous way the Lord said it's just a matter of time it shall be a pain in your flesh so you shall not be blessed you are not going to enjoy it living with a human being a man and because of riches and then you are coming up with all kinds of, you know, oh, this culture that we are in, if I don't do anything, and the family might come, and all kinds of stuff. That is why I said, we have to talk. Husband and wife must talk about these things. Everybody will die. We might as well talk and set things right and decide what goes to who if I go. What about if you go? We are contended about who will go first. Basically, that's, that's what the whole thing is all about. We are contending. We are striving about who will go first between the husband and the wife. You remember one day I asked this question. When, uh, you know, most of you remember it very well. That uh, a couple and then... Uh, you know, something had happened to your husband. Took, took the husband to the hospital. Let me repeat myself. And the doctors are saying that your, your, your husband needs a heart. That the man that you have, you have called your sweetheart, your sweet pie, and honey, and everything else. They are saying that it is only your heart that will match your husband's. No one else. They, need, they didn't say your kidney. Because you will say I have two, so let me give him one. But the heart. So in other words, you have to die in his stead. So what would you do? Somebody said no. What would you do? Ah, they said no way. Not even no. They said no way. So what would you do? So one young girl went home and asked the husband. He said, this is the situation that Pastor brought forth at church. So honey, it could also be reversed. It could be your wife. That you must be the husband you should give you. Uh -huh. So honey, this is, what would you do? You love me so much. Somebody said not to that extent. The husband looked at the wife and told the wife, he said, look, if it happened that you have problem with your heart and they have taken you to the hospital and they are saying that it's only my heart that can fit or match yours no you have to understand that it means god is calling you first you should go he simply said he said it means god is calling you first so you should go so who will go first is the problem over here most of the time that is when, you know, so, and it is very true because we said that inheritance is not only, even though God said for the children's children, Abraham said for the woman, my wife, and Ishmael as well. Don't leave that woman behind, stranded, when she had spent all her life with you. Don't leave her behind, stranded, solidly not. But if you decide that you want to be the last to go and you force your husband to go early, God said, that which you will have, he will not bless it. He will not bless it.
So in Genesis 21, verse 12b, it says, For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. God said it. God said, Abraham, send that Ishmael and Hagar away, because in Isaac shall thy seed be called. This is the reason why God told Abraham to listen to what Sarah was saying. If I don't know if Sarah knew, was Sarah's approach the same as God's approach? In other words, was Sarah thinking that because Abraham's seed is going to be, or the covenant that God made with Abraham, it is in Isaac and not in Ishmael. I don't know how deep she was in understanding with everything that had happened with the husband. If Sarah was coming to, you know, make the statement as she did in relation to the seed, the covenanted seed as God is telling Abraham, then Sarah, we thank God for that. But whichever way, at the end of the day, as far as God is concerned, God is not a partial God. God is not, you know, unjust God. God knew that which he is also going to do for Hagar and Ishmael as well. But the reason why God told Abraham to listen to the wife is because God said, push this young man away. I told you, I will, I will also make a nation out of him. I will bless him. I don't want him to be around because there is a covenant that needs to be respected over here. This is it. Now it is very clear when it comes to God's view. Don't go and make the statement that God didn't, you know, he was not a right judge or anything like that. He was. At the end of the day, who blesses? is God. It's God. But I, we said it, we, did, we don't know if, you know, Sarah was making the statement knowing of the covenant or not. If Sarah was only seeing the houses and the properties and, uh, and, and everything else, then we can question ourselves. But we give her the benefit of doubt that she was a covenanted woman that the Lord has spoken to her as well. Amen and amen. You see how the whole thing truly happened? At the outdooring, at the feast, when Ishmael was mocking, that was the time that everything, something that is, you know, it, it seems like it's so banal, right? But everything started just right from there. And you see how deep the whole situation is. To the, to the extent that God has to come in to settle the situation. Amen. So in Genesis 21, 13, we are bringing everything to an end. The Lord told Abraham, he said, also of the son of the born woman, will I make a nation because he is thy seed. So you can tell that God did not forget anybody. The Ishmael, I said, send him away. I'm starting something new with Isaac. But I'm not forgetting about him. He will be out there. I'm also going to watch. The same statement that God made to Hagar when Hagar was trying to run away and the Lord sent her back to that house. It's the same thing. God's position has not been changed. At the end of the day, you know what it means. It means that one has to live his life settled. Let me tell you, if anybody, your marriage, they are trying to cheat you. If for any reason in your family, they are trying to cheat, cheat you. It may be they are not dealing with you right. Someone must hold on unto his God. It is the Lord that blesses. When the Lord has blessed you, who can curse you? The blessings of the Lord, they are yea and amen. I prefer receiving inheritance from Almighty God than any house and property. What is it that the Lord has cannot do? And God said it. He said, any inheritance that you will grab unrighteously, I, the Lord, I will make it a curse in your hand. He said, I shall not bless it. That which is not blessed is cursed. You see how far the whole situation is going, right? You better set your minds right, all of us, in dealing with each other. This marriage business is not a, it's not a joke. 
It's a serious business in the sight of Almighty God. Everything counts. Every single thing counts. Everything counts. Hagar was an Egyptian woman. Sarah is Jew. So you have your African wife and your American wife. And you are thinking that the inheritance might go to the African wife. What about the one that is struggling here with you? May the Lord be our judge. Amen and amen. You go home and you go explain to the other one that you said, that is my American wife. Who, may God forgive you. Trying to justify yourself. Let me close everything. So God told Abraham, do as Sarah said in Genesis 21 verse 14. And Abraham, he rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Bathsheba. Amen and amen. The wilderness of Bathsheba. You think about it. You have to think about Abraham's state as well. If God did not come in, because the Lord had assured Abraham that he would take care of Ishmael. Look at the provision that Abraham gave. When someone is going to go through desert, the water that they would need, she was carrying the water on her shoulder. How much water do you need to go through that desert? The food that they need, it was just little bread. Abraham was a man of faith. He knew that his God shall supply. He knew that his God shall supply. Let me tell you, probably they left you with nothing. Probably when they shared the inheritance, they left you with nothing. But I thank God because God is with you. It is not over. God is with you. One must just have the wisdom. Maybe they sent you away without nothing. Nothing. But I thank God you are listening to the word of God. The gospel is open up unto you. The Lord is with you. The Lord will see you through. The Lord will see you through. God will see you through. God will see you through. Some of us, when we were born, I shouldn't say some of us. I should simply say, if you were born and you come to find nothing, father was not there, mother was not there, and nothing was there, you are just by yourself. You have to start from scratch. This word of God is also for you to tell you that as far as there is a God in your life, this God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in your life, seek for that which is right. The Lord is with you. He will keep you going. My last scripture, Matthew, 20, Matthew 19 verse 29. Matthew 19 verse 29. Listen to the statement of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, to everyone and each one of his disciples. He said, everyone that had forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Amen and amen. This is God's position. And this is what Jesus Christ. You see, so when we come to this platform, where may you, ma, 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 you know, my, must you or might you start from? The Lord is your portion. I said the Lord is your portion. Nothing was left for you, but the Lord is your portion. When you look at your parents, you can see that even if they die today, nothing will be left for you. But the Lord is still your portion. And if you are a parent and you are alive, we thank God for you to hear this message. Start working for your children's children. Leave something behind. Not dead. May the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Let's say amen. Amen. The word of the day is titled, Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Fear the Lord and depart from 
evil. The book of Luke, Luke chapter 12, and the verse is 4 and 5. The word of God says, Jesus talking, he said, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he had killed had power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto him, fear him. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. So, in other words, it's like fear and not to fear. Fear and not to fear. What should you fear and what not to fear? What should you fear and what not to fear? The scripture that we just read here, the Lord said that so many people are afraid of the devil because of what he will do to them. But the Lord said that there is no need for a child of God to fear the devil because the worst thing that the devil can do is to kill the flesh, is to kill the body. But afterwards, he has no power after death. Once the flesh is condemned, Satan and his demonic powers has no power after the flesh is gone. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, he said, it is your responsibility to fear the one who has power to kill the flesh and condemn the soul also in hell. This is the one that you should fear. Because the body might be killed, but the soul is saved by Almighty God according to the righteous life that one had lived. So, this fear that we have in living a life of torment by what the devil will do to you the word of God come to you today and tell you that you are not to fear the devil and his devices. But fear God who is able to destroy you completely. The fear of death is the reason why people fear the devil. The fear of death is the reason why people fear the devil. But Satan can only kill the body. He can only kill the body and afterwards, nothing else. But you can also see that the fear of death itself comes out of a life that is living after the flesh. A life that is living after the flesh is a life that brings one into bondage because you are living in the fear that you are going to die. You are living in the fear that you are going to die. You cannot trust the Lord for your healing. You cannot trust the Lord for your provisions. You cannot trust the Lord for the number of days that God has planned for your life. So as a result of that, you are moving around trying to seek for protection over your own life, over your children's life. And you are going to fetish priests and, I mean, just name it, witch doctors and all kinds of things that people do seeking for protection because they are living a life after the flesh and they fear to die. The Lord said, if only one will come to a level that you start seeing God as the ultimate, you will fear God and the Lord will be your asset. The purpose of your living. Hebrews chapter 2 and the verses 14 and 15. The word of God says, For as much 
then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood we also he said he also jesus christ also himself likewise took part of the same took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bandage you see that deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bandage because of the fear of death people have put their entire family on the bandage because of the fear of death the enemy Satan has records of people's life and using it as a key manipulator of their lives close and open at his will it is because it was delivered unto him their lives were delivered unto him because they could not see that God is the ultimate of life that the Lord God can protect them. So they run around in the fear that someone will kill them, someone will kill their children, that witchcraft activities are going to empower their lives. So they run to Satan for protection. The worst that he can do. You know, one thing about it is that people don't even know that as you go there, the guy, his nature, he did not come, Satan did not come to give life. So he does not have the ability to give life. He does not have the power to give life. Jesus has the power to give life. Satan came, he came here for one purpose. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is the attribute of Satan. So when you run to Satan for protection because you feared to die, it is like you are running from what? From far power to a higher fire. Consuming yourself. And people don't know this. You fear death, but you are running to death. This is what the scripture says. The scripture said that it is Satan who had the power of death. But Jesus Christ, through the work of Jesus, Jesus has taken that power out of his hands. Life and death, that key is in the hand of Jesus. Everyone that is moving around trying to seek for protection from darkness, let me tell you, you are outdated because Satan does not have that key anymore. Jesus Christ has taken the key of life and death out of Satan's hand. That is why he has power to kill the body. You also have power to kill someone. But afterwards, nothing else that Satan, Satan can do. We are delivered out of that spirit of death, bondage. And it is through the work of Jesus Christ. And that fear had become what is tormenting so many their lives. And they are under it, thinking that that fetish priest is the family idol. Our forefathers were being protected by that idol. So, we are also under the same protection. What are you saying? That idol will mess up your life, will mess up your children's life, will become, you know, it's a spirit, it does not die. You will be dead gone. Your forefathers, the proof is that they are dead gone. But still, the curse that the idol is enforcing in that family, so the whole family has come under the bandage. Because of the fear of death. Not knowing that Jesus Christ had already turned things around. So this is the reason why Romans 8, 13 to 16. The word of God says that he said. For if ye live after the flesh. Ye shall die. If you live after the flesh. You will die. But. If ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. 
through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, if you come to a point that your life had come under the authority of the Holy Spirit, you will live. You will live. Because verse 14 says that he said, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. As many that are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. A son of God is not someone who fears death. A son of God is not someone who is afraid of the one that is coming around to kill the body. You know why? Because verse, verse 15 says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You see that? You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Why again? Where we used to be. Where we used to be before the Lord redeemed us. But ye have received the spirit, the Holy Spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba Father. The Spirit itself, the Holy Spirit itself that is within you, beareth witness with our own spirit that we are the children of God. No one needs to tell you. It is what you have inside that is the inner witness of who you are. If you are moving around and you know that your spirit is controlled by an idol spirit, because of the curse that is upon the family, you know. But you don't have to be there because the Lord Jesus Christ had already paid the price. He said curse, Galatians 3.13 said curse, Jesus was made a curse because he was hanged on the tree. So the price has been paid for you to be out of any manipulation of the devil to kill you. What a great thing that the Lord Jesus has done for us. He has given us a spirit, the Holy Spirit that breaks fear. People are living, they are afraid that they will, they will be shortened of finances. They will be shortened of their health. Their children are not going to be doing well. They, will be, they won't have a job. I mean so many things that man is living with that great fear. And cannot. And as a result of that, this is the reason why they go and subdue themselves under the lower powers. When the Lord God had already free you. You are no more under the, the you know, the stripes of the Egyptians. For the Lord had already let you cross the Red Sea. No more. It is the time that the spirit empower you to cry, Abba Father. Abba is like daddy. It is the time that for one to have that wonderful fellowship with his daddy through Jesus Christ. So which brings forth a clear walk with the Holy Spirit. I, I am always saying this. I said you want to know Jesus, know the Holy Spirit. You want to know Almighty God, know the Holy Spirit through, <laughs> you know, know the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus to you. And once you know Jesus, you will know the Father. Philip, all this time that I have been with you, why is it that you are asking me of showing you the Father? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. But the spirit of the Lord, when he cometh, the spirit of truth, he will show you all things. He will show you all things, whatsoever that I say to you. Because he's coming to bring glory to the son. And the son keep not the glory, but return the glory to the father. This is the inheritance of the saints. This is the inheritance of the one that called himself a child of God. He moves in power. He doesn't fear the devil. He does not fear what the devil can do to him. Because in the worst case, the devil might be able to destroy the body. 
But before you can come around and destroy my body, knowing that God has you here because you are here for the purpose of Almighty God, and the Lord said that he has given you a number of days for those purpose, I will be with you when you are going through the waters. The fire, I will be there. There is no temptation that the Lord God will not be there. First Corinthians 10, 13 talks about, he said, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. God is faithful. The faithfulness of God is number one. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. And number two, in the worst case, with the temptation also, God will make a way for you to escape. Now you tell me, what power that the devil has over your life for you to fear him? No. You are not afraid of him. You cannot live in that fear. You cannot live in that torment to the extent that he said, which wrath in my family is going to kill me if I don't protect my children? Who can protect your children? There are only two powers in the surface of this universe. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And they are structured, we are not ignorant of them. You are saying that you are being chased by witches in your family and you run to a fetish priest. <laughs> it's like, it is the same cooperation. The same cooperation. Palm readers and uh, sorcerers and enchanters, and they are all magicians. It is the same company. The same thing. So, what is the Lord required of you? The book of Deuteronomy, God made a clear statement. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and the verse is 12. The word of God says, And now, Israel, what do the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. This is what the Lord required of you. You cannot forget this in life. As you are living, what is the Lord required of you? What God needs from you. God said that, you know, you have to fear me. The fear that God is talking about here is the reverential fear. It is not the fear that our father is going to kill you. It is the fear of respect, reverencing your father. This is the same fear. Because God is our father. So when he talks to us, his children, saying that, fear me. The fear that will bring you to the point that you walk in God's ways. The point that you will love him. And the point that you will serve the Lord with everything of you. All thy heart and all thy soul. So you can see what the fear of God can do to you. It brings you to a higher level of relationship to Almighty, with Almighty God. It will bring you to a higher level of relationship with the Holy Spirit. It will bring you to a higher level of relationship with Jesus Christ. And it will bring you to a higher level of life. That's it. The fear of God, when a man fears the Lord, it is life and it is health. It is life and it is health. So now, None of us should be deceiving ourselves. And that is one thing that I keep saying. They say that, oh, I am a child of God. The spirit of God is in me. The one that is in me, he's greater than the one that is in the world. Let me tell you this. The reason why the enemy can kill your body, it is because you might be coming to church and you have one leg in the church and another leg in the house of Satan. You have to know that the other leg, your leg that is in the church is not in the church. Please move it back to Satan. Because when that guy is coming, he has something in you. 
You hold something of him and he's coming after it. No deception. You cannot be coming around and saying that God is your father. No reverence. No honor. No fear. And you're just moving around. I'm a child of God. First Peter chapter 1 and the verse is 17 to 20. The word of God says that he said, If ye call on the Father, if ye call on the Father, who without respect of person judge according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. You know what it means? It means that if you call on the name of Almighty God, God is my Father. Okay. But you have to know that God is respecter of person. God is not respecter of what? Of person. In other words, he doesn't despise people. But he will judge everyone and each one of us according to the way that we lived here. So because of that, the fear of life, the fear of God has to come upon you so that you maximize your time over here in doing the right thing you maximize your time on earth here by doing the right thing so in other words the fear of god brings wisdom to live the fear of god brings you wisdom to live and the verse 18 says he said for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily, verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. What does it mean? What the word is saying here is that that wisdom of life is for you to understand that number one, you are not redeemed. You are not, you are not moved from darkness to the marvelous light of our Lord Jesus Christ by you being purchased by money, not by silver, not by gold, not by anything that can be perished. But it is by the precious blood of Jesus Christ that you were redeemed. Remember, because of fear, some people their entire life, they live in the bondage of death. But you, today you are called a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God. You know why? It is because you were bought at a price, inexhaustible price, purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. So the Lord said that have the wisdom to live your life in the greatness of what God has done for you. And fear not anything. Anyone that is living for the silver, you will not make it. You are heading to die. If you are living for money, so your life is the love of money. It is the love of money. We are not saying that money is not good. He said it is the love of money that has led many astray. How is he killing them? He is killing them by setting up a bet. And they are coming. Show me the money. He show you the money. You catch the money, you have shortened your life. Cut your life short. And the Lord saying that he said, no way. Your life cannot be bought with money. So don't go and take juju money. Don't go and exchange your life with money. Don't go and sell your life cheap. Because you are not for sale. You are not for sale. You have been bought a price that nobody can buy you again. So I say this. It's a wisdom that one needs to understand. So when you talk about the fear of God. You need that wisdom. Hebrews chapter 12 and the verse is 28. The word of God says. He said. Wherefore. We receiving a kingdom. Which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. Whereby 
we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. This is powerful. So when we come before the throne of God, one of the prayers that we should pray is that, God, please give me grace to fear you. How many of us are praying that, that, that prayer? Give me grace to fear you. Remember, what the Lord required of you, Israel, what the Lord required of you as a child of God, the Lord required of you to stand before the mighty throne of grace and pray to obtain grace to fear the Lord. Because when the fear of God has come upon you, when the fear of God had gotten hold of you, you will serve God in reverence. You will serve God. Say, Give me grace to serve you in reverence and in a godly fear. Give me grace. The grace that you obtain to serve the Lord and the fear of God come upon you. What do you think you are going to do? You will live a life of holiness. You will definitely live a life of what? Of holiness. It takes grace for one to be holy. Temptations are so many. It takes grace for one to live a life of holiness. How First Peter chapter 1 and the verses 14 and 15, the word of God says, he said, as obedient children, you are the one that call yourself a child of God, right? Okay. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. What does it mean? It means that now that you are a child of God, do not conduct yourself like what you used to be when you didn't know anything about God. Now the light has come upon your life. The wisdom is that you come in fear and in reverence to God and everywhere you go, the light is shining. You will know what is right and what is not right. Why would you go back to the things that you used to do that were not good in the sight of God? Now that you call yourself a child of God, now that the Holy Spirit is working within you, those type of loss of life, the pride of life, the loss of the eye, and all these things that the world display to people to catch them so that he can kill their bodies. God said that those things, they are over. The grace will give you wisdom to understand these things and not exchanging your precious life with things that are corruptible. We are not ignorant of those things that the enemy is trying to trap us with. So verse 15 of... First Peter 1, he says that, he said, but as he which had called you is holy. You see that? As he which had called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Hallelujah. You see, the one that had called you, his nature is holy. The one, that is why we need grace to serve this God. Because the holiness of God, to you know, when you are serving someone in reverence, you reverence when you are, you know, even when you are coming, it's like a king. You are coming, we are talking about the throne, so we talk about the king. And we are not talking about the king of our villages. We are not talking about the presidents of our countries. We are talking about the creator <laughs> of the universe. The one who is in charge of all things, including the schedule of the devil. So when you are coming, I mean, when we talk about reverence, how we should reverence God, we come in that fear of reverence. You cannot reverence him if you don't know who God is. You cannot fear him if you don't know who God is. You can't. Be holy because your king is holy. Be holy because your nature should be holy. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and the verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1, the word of God says that he said, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, 
Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Every single thing in our lives that is not going to glorify God, you know, because there is an in inward witness. Remember, he said that we witness the same way. You know, we Christians, we love taking scriptures that fit, is, fit our situations. We love that. When the scriptures fit our, you know, so we claim, we say that, yes, I have the Holy Spirit within me, and I can testify that I'm a child of God because the Holy Spirit is witnessing with my own spirit. Let me tell you, the same Holy Spirit is also witnessing with your own spirit that you should be holy. That you should be holy. That that situation of flesh, things that you are doing, that you know that this is not what the Lord, he said, even in your holiness, still perfect your life into holiness again. So there are levels of holiness. Amen. We have to be holy in every way that the Lord God has called us. And you know, Ephesians chapter 5, let's see this, one of them. Ephesians chapter 5 and the verses 21 and 22. And I will also read 25. The word of God says that he said, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You see that? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We are to walk with each other in the fear of God. We are to walk in the each other with each other in the fear of God. This scripture here is related to the marriage. But you see, as we are married to Christ, and the Lord God also has given us physical marriage that you have your husband, you have your wife. So the Lord said that wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You see that? Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands. Love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for the church. Everyone has to share. In our individual relationships, we have our shares. We are to fear the Lord in our relationships. What you don't want someone to do to you, please don't do it to that person. What you don't want someone to do it to you, don't do it to the person. And in the same line, I will also say that do not do good to people and expecting to receive good from the same person. That is why people get, you know, he said that, okay, last time when your situation, it was me who did this. And so when it is your case today and the same person is not under you, what you did to it. So you get angry and you are, you are angry against God. You are angry against the person. And I said, no, 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 no. That is not what God said. There's the principle of sowing and reaping. God never said that if you sow to the person A's life, the person A's life is going to sow back to you. That's not, he said, sowing and reaping. You might sow to his, his life, but it is the person H's life who is going to sow into your life. Break loose from false, you know, f f f false expectations. And be clear to what the, the, the word of God says. So, this is what I will add also. I say this. I said that, you know, we are always ignorance of the levels our ways of life number one should be God number one God number two family number three ministry all right <laughs> number one God number two family number three ministry so if you come into the ministry and you are behaving and you say, hey, man of God, and then I say, meanwhile, you are not able to get, take care of your family, forget it. Forget it. You don't fear God. You don't fear God because you are not respecting what the Lord, the order of God. Don't come and rule anyone in the church. Don't do that because you can't rule your own family. A husband that is not giving the love to the wife. You are disobeying God's commandments. And we saw it. As children, we are not to disobey. We are not to disobey God. Everything has to be done in great fear. And as a wife, 
submitting to your husband does not mean that you have become a slave to your husband. Why is it that you connote the word submission with that much negativity? Absolutely not. The Lord created you as a helper. Two is always better than one. And God said it. When we are both together moving and doing, you know, the right thing in the sight of God, God said that he made them one flesh because he knows they are two, but he made them one flesh. Unity, it, it is good. When people come together, the Lord told them, he said that the people are one. They will be able to build this tower of Babel if you don't come in and confuse their language. Amen. When people are one, it is great. Unity. Loving your husband. Submitting, you know, submitting to your husband. Loving your wife. Submitting also to your wife. It goes in both directions. You cannot be standing there and say that uh, I am the head of the family. You cannot do that. No, 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 no. That's not what the Lord is talking about. It is unity. We cooperate. Submit ourselves one to another. Husbands, submit to your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. In the fear of God, So the moment that that fear had gripped you, the moment that you are captured by the fear of God, there are certain things that are going to happen in your life. Second Corinthians chapter 2, and the verse is 2, Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. The word of God says, he said, to whom ye forgive anything, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. You see that? You forgive. Whatever that you forgive, God also forgive. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sake forgave I it in the person of Christ. You see that? So, when we move around, people wronging us and we forgiving them, God said that he also forgave us. And when the Lord God has forgiven someone, it is because of us that the person has been forgiven. And everything is done in the love of Christ. On the ground of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And verse 11 says that, he said, if you don't forgive one another, least Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. You see that? We are not ignorant of his devices. So the fear of the Lord is to be mindful of the devices of the enemy. The spirit of unforgiveness is a very killing spirit. Because if you, moving around, people wronging you, you are not able to forgive them. And the enemy will harden your heart. And say that, why is it that such a prominent person like you, honorable, why is it he's not coming to call you honorable? And then you are, you, you know, you, 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 no, 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 no. So the next time the person is greeting you, <laughs> honorable, why are you calling me honorable today? Last time you saw me, did you call me honorable? You know, and you, you, you are just high blood pressure. You will die early. Satan will just, it's a device of the enemy that to kill you. To kill you. We get angry and the spirit of unforgiveness grip our heart. But we don't even know that we are shortening our own lives. Not only that, he said that Satan is taking advantage of it. And it's a, it's a, it's, it's a device of the devil. A device is like a weapon. He said this particular situation is a weapon. So please, from this year going, when someone, whatever that they have done, no matter how hard it is, go before God and ask God for grace. In the worst situation, go before God and ask God for grace. Please, Lord, this thing is hurting me so much. You know, honesty is good. You know your heart. You know you still have something against the person. Lord, give me grace to release this person. No one should be having stones in his pocket or her pocket to throw against anyone this year. Release people. Let them go. Let them go. The reason why is that because if you free them, you free your own destiny. If you free them, you free your own life. If you free them, you free your finances. If you free them, you free your health. 
Devil's devices are crafty. So you can see how he can use people now to bury you, to bury your life. One who's completely careless out there, open the door for the enemy to come in. Satan uses that person to come and annoy you. Do something so hard for you that you cannot even forgive the person. What do you think you are doing? Your life is being scattered. That person is an agent of devil. An agent of devil. He's not ready to come to be saved anyway. But the moment that you understand that the agents of the devil, they are moving around, causing people's life to be scattered. You see them and you know what? <laughs> go away with your trouble. <laughs> go, just, just, just go. Just go. I release you. May the Lord forgive you. Go. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You benefit when you fear God. The book of Job. You remember Job? This wonderful man. Job chapter 1 verse 9 and 10. You know, this time, let me tell you this. If you don't believe the word of God, believe what Satan says. <laughs> believe what Satan says about God. Because in the presence of God, Satan cannot lie. You see that? <clears throat> Satan made such a profound statement. Almighty God told Satan, he said, have you seen my son, Job? How he fears me. And Satan answered. He said that verse 9. Satan said. Do Job fear God for not? In other words. Do Job fear God for nothing? No. Let me tell you the reason why Job fears you. So please. Listen to the reason why. From, this, is from, this is a testimony from Satan. Satan said. Has not thou God made an hedge about him? <laughs> so there is a face. Amen. Satan declared it clearly that Job fears you and you have made a hedge. A hedge. If, you know, what people are roaming around to go and look for in the fittest priest's house, in the satanic powers, when people are moving around seeking for protection over their children so that they will not die. God, the fear of God brings that protection over your life. This is handwriting, testimony, confession of Satan. Believe it. You have built a hedge about him and about his house. Your house is protected. Amen. About his house and about all that he had on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substances is increased in the land. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, prosperity, the real definition of prosperity is fearing God. Amen. Amen. When you fear God, you be prospered. When you are gripped by the fear of God, you will be prospered. Your health shall be prospering. Your house are secured your you know everything he said every side and whatever that your hand touches it is what it is being prospering simply because we fear god please this year 2014 and for forever that you will live in your lifetime here never forget forget that the fear of god is the most important thing in the man's life the fear of god is the most important thing in a man's life. It is simple. It brings health. It brings security. It brings protection. It brings fulfillment of life. You can see that one that fears God is not a prey to the devil. Satan himself is saying that I cannot go there because Job fears you and you have protected him. I cannot touch Job's children. I cannot touch Job's house. I cannot touch Job's health. I can't touch anything of Job. Let me say this to you. The man Job that was living in the righteousness, you as a child of God, you stand in the holiness of the living God. Don't let the word holiness threaten you. 
Do not. It's a life that you are living, building a character to become more and more like Jesus Christ. By the help of the Holy Ghost. Satan has no access to anything that you do. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and the verses 9 to 11. He said, wherefore, we labor, we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of God. You see that? We live our lives. We are laboring. We are working. We are doing the ministry, the work, and family life, and everything else. We are living our life here so that either present or absent, alive or dead, we will be accepted by God. That is security. Amen. Eternal security. Amen. He said, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore that, knowing therefore, the terror of the Lord, the terror of the Lord is the fear of the Lord, okay? The terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are make manifest unto God. And I trust also, all made manifest in your conscience. Let me explain this scripture. God is simply saying that, the life that you are living here, you have to live a life, a godly life. Doing the right thing in the fear of the Lord. So either you are alive or you are dead. Either you are alive or you are dead, God will receive you. You will please him and he will receive you. So knowing this is, what you have to do is that you have to make sure that whatever that you are doing to your body, the life that you are living, it is right in the sight of God. Period. Period. This is all that the, the word of God is saying here. Be conscious and do these things in the fear of God. That's it. Because one day, one day, you did good, you did bad, you are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm stopping just right here. I'm going to give you an example of a man that lived. In the book of Acts, chapter 10, and the verse is 1 to 4. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the bound called the Italian bound. Cornelius, a certain man. This man, he was a devout man, and one that feared God. Devout man, dedicated man, a man that feared God with all his house. Please. Let the fear of the Lord come upon your household. With all his house, he fears the Lord, which gave much alms to the people. His hands was not short. The guy, he was generous in heart. When you fear God, you become very generous. When you fear God, you become very generous. Number one, you'll be able to share your knowledge of God to someone. People are so stingy because they don't fear God. That they don't even want to share their Bible. If you fear God, you will share the word of God to someone. Because you have understanding of where the, head, the person is heading to. The man fears God. And he had brought the fear of God over his house. Everyone in there is gripped by the fear of God. And had taught his heart to be good. To people, he loved them. Compassion, just name it. He was giving alms. And he prayed to God always. The fear of God will make someone to pray. Amen. The fear of God. So a child of God that is not a prayerful child of God is one that fear not God. Please don't come and dance and say that God, you are my everything. You are just no, no, you don't fear God, you don't pray. He's not your everything. You are not even able to reverence him. Prayer is a form of reverence. 
Because the moment that you come, you come in subjection to God. He said, the Lord, I reverence you, I trust you with my life. So the man who feared God, he was always praying, and he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto Cornelius, he said, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thy arms are come up for a memorial before God. Hallelujah. Hey, the fear of God will make one keep his household under the Holy Ghost control. The fear of God will make one's household to become a house of prayer. The fear of God brings forth vision. Hallelujah. The fear of God. The man feared God and he saw an angel that came with a message from the Lord. You want to move a higher level with God? You want to move this year in a higher level with your relationship with Jesus Christ? Fear God. Fear Jesus. Fear Holy Spirit. Some of them, they don't even fear Holy Spirit at all. The one, the one that is in you, just right there, with this other, oh, spirit. <laughs> it's like, no, you cannot put him aside, or he's in you. When you are laying on the bed of fornication, he's there. You don't fear that the man is there with you. This is what he's saying. His prayer, because of the fear that he has for God. His prayer and his deeds, the arms. Everything has come before the Lord as a memorial. Let me tell you, as parents, when we bring that fear of God in our homes, we are laying a foundation, a memorial before God. We will be gone. Our children shall be remembered. Our children's children shall be remembered. We are building a godly home, a godly foundation, and it is not a curse from any power of darkness. But it's a blessing established by Almighty God. There is no variance in God. He changeth not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your children, 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 they will come to meet him. And the foundations that you have laid, God will remember your prayer towards their lives. God will remember your arms towards their lives. God will remember your deeds towards their lives. Because your prayer has come as a memorial. Something that is a memorial before God, <laughs> nothing is going to destroy it. Amen. May the Lord God bless you. Everyone is very welcome. Today being a very special day, we thank God for your lives. We have a word from the living God that we title, The Power of Resurrection Life. The Power of Resurrection Life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let me read you a scripture that gives forth the foundation of Christianity. Foundation of Christianity. If this one fails, then there is everything that we are doing is all in vain. But we thank God it did not fail. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 12 to 22 going to read through it because you have to know that this is there and it's the assurance of everything that we do as Christians. He said, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? This is a fact. We have people that are thinking that Jesus did not rise, but he did. So Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, how can some of you say that Jesus did not arise? Verse 13, he said, but if there'll be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. Hallelujah. 
And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are all found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Jesus Christ whom he raised up not if so be that the dead raise not rise not if so be that the dead rise not for if the, do the dead rise not then is not Christ raised and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all, of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Hallelujah. That's it. If there was no resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christianity doesn't hold. If there is no resurrection, he's saying that then they that are dead, they are also gone in vain. There is no hope for them. If there is no resurrection, we that are living, believing in Christ, then that will be the end of us all. That will be the end of life. As far as soon as man dies, then that's it. But this is not what the word says. Because we testify of his resurrection, then everything that we do as Christians, none of them is in vain. Because the same way he said, as the, the, the first Adam, he died. He sinned. And he died. But the second Adam, he took our sins upon him, died with it, and resurrected. There is hope for you and I. There is hope for our Christianity. There is hope for our children. There is hope for our future. And there is hope after death. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm. So we know that our God, Jesus Christ, is alive. For the father raised him up. God raised Jesus Christ with mighty power. And set Jesus at his right hand. Ephesians chapter 1 and the verses 19 to 23. Apostle Paul wrote by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. He said, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us? To us word who believe. According to the working of his mighty power. Christianity is not just a fake thing. It's not fake. Christianity, it is practical. It is powerful. And as you are, you, 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 you are moving from day to day, you will testify. This is not something that someone should come and be telling you stories. It's life. Personal experience. Personal testimonies. The reason why I'm doing what I am doing, it is personal not anyone trying to brainwash, brainwash you. It's a fact. It's a reality. There is power. There is power to us that believe in Christ. According to the working of his mighty power. Which he wrought in Christ. When he raised him from the dead. And set him at his own right hand. In the heavenly places. Hallelujah. Set him at his own right hand. In the heavenly places. Now watch. In the heavenly places. Far above principalities and powers. Might and dominions. And every name that is named. Not only in this world. But also in that which is to come. Far above principalities and powers. 
far above principalities and powers in heavenly places because we know that the second domain of heaven is the dwelling of the devil so if you said that christ has is risen and now in heavenly places where is, is he has he become satan's friend no almighty god raised jesus christ and has set him far above far above principalities and powers between where those darkness is in heavenly places and where jesus sits is far above we're gonna find out what does it mean for a child of god the power that has been given to us it is not something that devil can match it because if we are believers of jesus and where jesus is that's where we are then we sit over the devil's head we sit far above devil's throne god raised jesus and sat him on his right hand far above if one a child of god comes to understand that his master is far above the one that is far above you can even crash on your head thank you lord verse 22 of ephesians 1 he said not only he has put him far above principalities and the powers and might and dominions and everything else he had put also all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that fill it all in all hallelujah this is where the church the power of the church is coming from the father raised the son and set him far above anything that can torment you far above at the right hand of the father above the principalities and the powers and now gave him power set everything at his feet the domain of the devil is a doormat to christ the domain of the witches and the wizards they are doormats do you know what a doormat is when you are getting into your room that you have dust on your feet at your shoes you clean up this way doormat shake the dust of the feet upon their heads thank you lord and he said that this is this is the power that fills the church this is the power that fills the church so what it means that as children of god because of what god has done for us through the resurrection of christ there must not be any devilish dark throne principalities and powers rulers of this world that we are fighting with they are not to overcome you because christ has conquered them long ago and has given you power to live over their heads that's what it means they will fight but they will not prevail they will fight you at work they will not prevail they will fight your family they will not prevail they will fight your finances they will not prevail why because christ had prevailed prevailed it takes one's understanding to come up higher if you are you are an ego and you don't see yourself as an ego and mingling with, with, with chicken but the very day that you come to find out that you are not a chicken you are an eagle that's the day that you start soaring i pray for somebody here this very day where we are remembering the resurrection power of our lord jesus christ anything that is bringing you down we crash over them in the name of jesus christ this power here has been given to the church he said he felt he has put all things under his feet and filled the church with that power the pillar of life 
That is Jesus Christ. He holds everything together. When Christ is not there, everything is broken. Nothing holds. Thank you, Lord. He raised him and gave him power. But so far, Jesus Christ is the only one who has been resurrected and ever resurrected. Lazarus was raised by Jesus, but he died again. Upon all the great things that people are saying, nobody ever claimed that I was dead and now I am alive. It is only our Lord Jesus and nobody there from generations to generations. No one, it is an unquestionable matter. He's dead, resurrected. Everything holds by him. Period. Period. There's no question about it. He lived. He's alive and well. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He has given power, but there is a power that brought forth Jesus Christ out of the grave. That is why they couldn't believe. What is this thing that we are hearing? That the man is risen? What? Could that be possible? We know that he went and raised Lazarus. But who, who raised him up? Romans 8, 11. He said, but if the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that rose up, that, that, that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwell in you. God that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Hallelujah. The hope of life, the hope of future is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You have to see what, had, what took place here. Jesus Christ did not die of himself and did not, he, he, didn't, he, he didn't raise himself either. He was killed. Everybody testified. The earth shook trembled. Darkness was upon the face of the universe. The veil at the temple was torn. The dead rose up. Jerusalem was filled with life from dead. They testify of his dead. They saw him when the Lord rose him up. It was done by the power of the Holy Ghost. The father said Jesus was filled with Holy Ghost from the womb. Dwell in him. Sought him through circumstances. In the grave, he was quickened by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit came back again. I have good news for you. The same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the, from the grave is the same Spirit that God has given you. This is the hope that tomorrow, your tomorrow is definitely assured that grave cannot contain your life. In the name of Jesus. Very powerful. Who is the God out there that I'm serving him and when I'm dead, I'm dead? What is the purpose? We serve a living God. And when we are dead... The same spirit that rose our master, he will quicken our mortal bodies. Come back to life again. Hallelujah. You know, when you hear these things, one must think of life. One, the greatest fear of man is dead. That is the greatest fear of every man. No matter how much they boast, oh, I am ready. 
I am when he is coming, you can see that you are not ready. I am ready. You are not ready. You cannot be ready for dead. You don't know what it is. That's why once they are dead, the one that says he's ready, they're dead. You look at them, he wasn't surprised. Surprise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You see, the assurance that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we know that. The assurance that we have is that he has given us Jesus as an example. So the same way that he did for Christ, he's also going to do it for you. Believers, when that is, is, is a transition. It's a transition. It's a way. A way to the glorious things that are ahead of us. This place is temporal. Everything that anyone is doing is all temporal. But the eternal, we go through eternity, through death. So as believers, if you have lived the right life, when you are dying, <laughs> you are laughing. Hallelujah. You are laughing. Amen. We talk to them about he has gone home. You cannot say that this one has gone home when he, has, he doesn't know Jesus Christ. If you die outside Christ, you, are, you have not gone home. Have you ever seen any obituary in all paper that says that this one has gone to a far country? They said he has gone home always. When even he doesn't have a home. But we have a home. We have a home. A home. John 14, 1. He said, believe in God and believe also in me. For in my father's house, there are many mentioned. And I'm going there to prepare one for you. Here you have houses. After death, you'll be having mansions. Hallelujah. What profited a man to lose? I said to gain the whole world and lose his soul. Vain. A life of vain. Life of hope is what we are testifying of today. So resurrection of Christ is the hope of our salvation. Resurrection of Christ is the hope of our salvation. Romans 10, the verses 9 and 10, he said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God the Father had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Salvation is only in the name of Jesus. Salvation is through the resurrection power of Christ that we are saved. Verse 10, he said, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Hallelujah. We confess that our God is alive and well. That we are saved by him. That through his resurrection power, as death could not contain him, death cannot overcome you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So the fear of death, the fear of death is broken. Completely broken. Christ's resurrection is not like any other resurrection. His resurrection is, 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 is conquered dead. He conquered it. And we said it before. That no one ever had experienced such a thing. It has never happened. It happened to Jesus. It will happen to you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Mm. So, Hebrews chapter 2 and the verses 14 and 15. He said, For as much, as, as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime 
subject to bandage. Hallelujah. Only God knows that devil has people in captivity. So many. Because of this fear of death. Many have gone and subscribed their family members to the register of the devil. He said, I don't want any witch to kill my family. I don't want any witch to kill my children. I don't want anything to happen to my children. So as a result of that, you know what he's doing? He's moving around seeking for a place of security. And you see the fetish priest there. He said, don't worry. Don't worry. We have all power. We can protect your family. Bring me their names. They registered their names. He said, now you all belong to me. I am going to protect everybody in this family. Not knowing it's an evil covenant that is being established. They will visit you. Thinking that they are protecting you. Not knowing they are killing you slowly. The entire family has come under fear. Because of what is happening in the family. As a result of that evil covenant. People are dying every year. Limitation has been set over the family. Powers of darkness are operating. Nobody is rising in that family. And many are gripped with so much fear. The least thing that you do, they kill you. And they are worshipping it. Some of them talk boldly about, about this. I heard a girl telling me, hey, in my family, in my family, nobody can kill us. You cannot eat our meat. I said, look at you. What you